I wasn't happy about that. But I also didn't know that I was going to have a career in tech. Um, it was just sort of my first journey. And I wanted to highlight that picture because I could have used a picture from my graduation, but that tends to lead people away from cybersecurity because they think, oh, I need a degree in computer science, I need a degree in network engineering or in cybersecurity. So that's just to show that, well, if you manage to get to third grade, it was a security analyst where we monitored quite a lot of security events for banks and different companies. But as I was monitoring sort of this landscape um, with BlackBerry and Bulletproof, you always saw the same companies coming up. The same countries um, as sort of the threat actors. They're the ones who are doing quite a lot of the hacking. So those countries, China, Russia, are always the top two. But one that always surprised me was Nigeria, South Africa. Um, we've all heard the story of the African prince who needs money transferred. And that's pretty much cybersecurity at the very beginning. And over time, that story of that Nigerian prince has evolved. There's so many ways now, um, through social engineering, that people can actually try get money from you. So I now work for the University of Hertfordshire as an assistant systems consultant, which is actually very difficult to say. Um, I focus on security, a security system that takes in logs. So when a student logs into a computer, what happens? What do they do? And how can we action on that? So if a student was to introduce a virus to the university, um, the program that I'm working on will be able to tell and say, oh, this is what happened and at what time. I also work for Foundervine um, as a technology consultant. And I don't know if you saw Izzy, Annette, they were on the stage what, 30 minutes ago talking about Foundervine. So the first question, I probably should have opened with this, what is cybersecurity? Every time you go on Google and ask that question, you get the standard definition. It's the protection of internet connected systems, including hardware, software, and data from hackers. Internet connected systems. Um, quite a lot of people, I think we had a talk yesterday where they mentioned we're now seeing smart fridges. So what does that mean for the home? Um, we now have more devices. We have mobile phones, we have tablets, laptops. We're now having kitchenware that is connected to the internet. So in theory, we're actually moving to a more riskier world because there's now so many more opportunities for people to hack you. We've seen incidences of Alexas being taken over and people can control the light. That's the doom side of it. But don't worry, there's some happy side. Um, but as I was looking at this statement, so we're protecting it from hackers. But what is a hacker? When we watch um, TV, you always see the hackers as people in a dark room somewhere that the main character comes up to and they tell them a simple question. Can we get in? The answer, give me five seconds. You hear some typing <laughs> and I'm in the mainframe. I actually didn't know what a mainframe was, um, but yeah, it's a term that's now associated with cybersecurity. So I went on Google and I thought, what does a hacker look like? And these were pretty much the most common images that were coming up. A guy in a mask that I now found out is from a film. There's actually a lot of images of people in masks. Um, a bunch of old men in a room with a lot of TVs looking at maps, and the stereotypical someone who does IT, a white guy, glasses, wearing a hoodie to work. But that's not the environment that I work in. So I started looking at different terms. What does an African hacker look like? This kept coming up. It was always the same images, someone in a mask, a bunch of old men, and a guy in a hoodie. So what does that mean for the landscape when people are looking to say, oh, I want to be, I want to work in cybersecurity, but this is all you see. So TV shows, um, they're where we get the portrayal of these images from. So V for Vendetta is where that mask came from. People watched it and it led to a revolution. We start looking at how Africa is moving, for example. We've seen the digital rise in Tunisia, Egypt, as people are becoming more connected also comes the activism. People are now, even Zimbabwe, there was an internet issue, I think it was in February, where Zimbabwe turned the whole internet off. 
Africa is realizing the power of the internet, and with it comes hackers, people who are looking to bring the government to account, and that's where the V for Vendetta mask comes in from. So <laughs> I had a look to see, okay, so we now know what hackers are, but there's apparently a three million skill shortage in cybersecurity. And as Titus has shown us, it's actually a shocking number. There's not that many industries where you'll hear that there's three million jobs worldwide, and it, that number's growing. So businesses are saying there aren't enough people to fill these jobs. But yet businesses, cybersecurity businesses, keep sponsoring the same events where they keep finding the same kind of person. I don't think we had that many cybersecurity companies sponsor today's event. But if we were to look at B-Sides, which is a cybersecurity event, every single company that does anything cyber would love to sponsor that. But yet, they will complain and say, well, when we are trying to find this talent, we're not really getting diverse candidates, but you're not looking in the right place. So this is where there's a skill shortage. But if we're gonna be looking at, okay, so what businesses are missing some of these skills? What, there's a business in the UK, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it. Um, it's quite popular, they seem to be in almost every town, there'll be like a branch or something. It's called the NHS. 60% um, of the NHS still uses some form of Windows XP. That seems like a wild number because when you go into the doctor's surgery, you don't see Windows XP. So where are they using it? So when we start thinking, okay, how about in hospitals? When you go for an x-ray, what's the operating system that x-ray machine is running? More than likely, it's Windows XP. When the NHS purchased most of this equipment, it was years ago, and they've managed to make it last as long as it has. But when we now look at a report by Microsoft in March 2019, which is only a few weeks ago, 1.7% Five percent of the world uses Windows XP, but yet in 2017, 60 percent of the NHS used Windows XP. That's actually a very big number, but what does that actually mean to say, okay, they use Windows XP, I guess it still works. What's the issue in that? We start looking now at Microsoft, who in 2014, they stopped developing Windows XP. They don't push any updates. If there's a hole in it, there's a hole in it. If there's a way to hack into it, there's a way to hack into it. They don't support it. They've had Windows 7, Windows 10, and other people have now started using Apple products in their businesses. But yet the NHS, sadly, still has some remnants of Windows XP. We had an incident um, a few years ago. It might have made the news. Um, a virus or malware called WannaCry. Don't know if anyone remembers it. Um, it kind of hit the NHS quite hard. A lot of people had to cancel doctor's appointments because ransomware was pretty much plaguing the whole NHS. It was saved by someone who kind of looked like me. Um, he was a security professional. He realized the threat and he found a solution on how to stop it. And that was actually very inspiring um, at that point because you don't necessarily always see someone who's black in the media in terms of hacking being portrayed in a good light. So this was one of the few inc incidences where we can actually say, oh wow, this happened. And so I started now looking at the job. So who would protect the NHS um, in a time of crisis? And you always see sort of the same job roles, threat intelligence analysts, security researchers, and security analysts. Not many people actually understand what this is. So people will be put off by these jobs. So even if you work for a company that has some of these positions, and let's say you work as a developer, you would never think, oh, I might have the skills to perform these tasks. And that's what my talk today is gonna be focusing on. So we're gonna be looking at some of the roles so that developers can play in protecting some of these businesses. Is there any developers in here today? Well, there's quite a few, quite a few. 
So in cybersecurity, there's a term that's always thrown around, wearing the right hat. We have three different streams. We have white hat hackers, black hat hackers, and gray hats. The white hat is the path everyone or legally should be on. <laughs> These are the people you hire to help test out your product. So if you have a website and you want to make sure it's safe, you would employ a white hat hacker to go and test that. To say, how can someone break into it? Give me a report to say, where am I vulnerable? The black hat hackers is the illegal side. And as we saw with, I think it was Marcus Hutchinson, he's the one who saved the NHS from WannaCry. He started off as a white hat hacker, but depending on what news you read, he's now on trial in America um, for black hat hacking activities. So it's very easy to actually cross the threshold because hacking is accessing a system you're not supposed to. The gray hat area is the gray part of security where no one is actually sure, are you, what are you actually doing? Are you hacking for fun or are you trying to protect people? So what we saw in 2013, a researcher called Khalil realized there was a big bug in Facebook. He emailed Facebook as you're supposed to and said, I found a bug where I can actually take over any account. How do you think Facebook reacted? They didn't care. They said, well, it can't be replicated. And the only way he could prove to them that this is actually a very big bug was to take over Mark Zuckerberg's account. And yeah, straight away they realized, oh, this is actually a problem. Um, so, but to get there, it took him from going from being a white hat hacker, trying to show that there's a vulnerability, telling the company, as you're supposed to, but they didn't listen. The black hat now, um, yesterday we had a talk on AI, and they mentioned an interesting report um, that applies to London, the gang matrix. So this is a database of information that the Met used to keep on people they thought were gang members. But to be on the list, there was no guidelines as to how they were adding people, and not many people knew of it. Recently, someone leaked that information, and there's now been some court cases where they've mentioned how that information could have been used in a murder. When it now comes to the black hat, people are always on the fence. If they are hacking information that people are hiding from us and bringing it out to light, does that make it good? If we don't have a diverse mix of white hat hackers who are protecting stuff that matters to us as a community, black hat who will bring certain things to light, or even the gray hats, what does that mean for the black community? And that's one of the problems we face. We need more of the ethical hackers. Penetration testers need to support black businesses. So how many times do we see, you go on someone's website and there's a little security warning telling you, oh, it doesn't have a certificate. The black community needs more penetration testers who are going out to these businesses and performing the service. We need more people in cybersecurity who can speak to our friends who are making these websites and saying to them, your website actually isn't safe. Because if you value your website, what happens today if you go on and someone's taken over it and now asking for 10,000 pounds to give you back your brand? We have malware analysts who work in the field of computer and network security to understand ransomware. How does it infect computers? So if you're thinking, but I don't actually want to study computer science. In fact, I, do, I did nothing to do with computer science. How do I get involved? Because these seem all very technical. That's where cybersecurity is different to quite a lot of industries. The more diverse you are, the better analysts you make. Because not only do you give a different viewpoint that not many people have, so if we have anyone who works in finance, for example, there's certain information you know that will never be taught on a computer science course. So when it comes to banks, you are the people they're looking for. You identify trends and patterns that seem abnormal. 
when we start looking at digital forensics, people who did criminology, they understand the law the best. When we start looking at policy and governance, revenge porn is a crime that's now becoming more prominent. We're seeing more cases of it in the news, but we need people shaping the policies. People who study law make excellent policy advisors. They understand the law, and if they can understand the tech side of, as well, they can help regulate. Because when we start looking at the law that actually governs cybersecurity, it's the Computer Misuse Act, which kind of came around in 1980. And then you start thinking, what's happened in tech since 1980? Yes, they update it and add laws as threats become or appear, but it doesn't move fast enough. So we always end up with a situation where there's some legal gray area, and that's where we need people who are from backgrounds such as the social sciences, from law, and for finance. Fraud is one thing that affects communities everywhere. Having more people from finance make that switch to cybersecurity will only help the field. So now comes the question, but how do I get into cybersecurity? What do I need to do? So the higher education route is still one of the most popular ways to get into cybersecurity. Quite a lot of people would do a computer science degree. If you've done a computer science and you focus on software engineering, it's very possible to just start doing your training. If you're a developer, as you code, you tend to follow security practices, meaning you code in a cyber secure, safe way. When you then now change hats and want to go into security, it actually helps because you you've learned how to build websites in a very secure way, so you'll know how to bring them down. So for developers, it's very easy to then make this change into cybersecurity. Training and qualifications. There's industry standard qualifications that you can find by just looking at jobs. If you go on any job application, they will tell you, oh, we need CISSP. I myself, from memory, can't even remember what the acronym means. But you can still do those kind of courses. Immersive Labs is a product I would highly recommend. They produce labs where you can just log on today as a student. So if anyone's still at university, you log on as a student and you can actually try different lab environments where you just learn about cybersecurity. Try Hack Me as well. Nice name. It's another platform where they teach you how to hack. They have different labs, different levels. So if you're a very beginner and you just want to know the key terms, just to understand what is security, Try Hack Me is a very good platform. They have some free modules that you can try out. And then if you want to get a paid account, it's possible. So for me, I have a home environment because practice does make perfect. A security operating system, um, Kali is the industry standard, or ParrotSec OS. This is just an operating system similar to Windows, except it's suited for cybersecurity. So when you log in, one thing that always shocks people is how easy it is to actually use it. You don't have to read a manual. You literally just click on the start window, and it tells you, oh, do you want to do a wireless attack? Here are the tools you need. Do you want to hack a website? Here you go. You can use one of these seven tools. All the tools come with manuals, and it tells you. So when you realize that, OK, the people trying to hack us, these are the tools they use, and it's so easy for them to learn, well, why don't I learn as well so I can defend against it? Having a virtual environment helps as well. So sometimes when you're looking for jobs, you will find these skills that you might not possess. But it's something you can actually try at home. Practicing will make you perfect at it simply because there's not just one way to hack into a machine. There's not one way to hack a website. There's different ways to achieve all these goals. So having that sort of environment and using tools like the Raspberry Pi or Arduino microcomputers, as homes become more interconnected, we're now starting to see some of these little home devices appearing, and people are using them for cybersecurity purposes because it gives you a Linux environment that you could hack into, 
and because it's your own system, you're not breaking the law. So I put this picture up um, because that's one of the key important advices from this talk. Practice makes perfect. And if you're going to take anything from today, even if you choose to not go into a career in cybersecurity, refining your skills in whatever you do will help you get better at it. For anyone who may have fell asleep, I'm um, summarizing now. Um, we need diversity in cybersecurity. These problems only diverse people will be able to solve, challenge, or acknowledge. You don't need to be from an IT background. It's even better if you're not. The Computer Misuse Act is very real. Um, we've recently seen Julian. Assange um, being dragged from the embassy for hacking, really and truly. He will be extradited, supposedly, to America. Um, and that's through laws such as the Computer Misuse Act. So whenever you're practicing your skills, just always remember that, yeah, it's very easy to find your IP address. Practice really does make perfect. So I wouldn't have, have had the career that I have if I didn't practice at home. So sometimes after work, I finish, and if I need to learn something, I have to spend two hours either reading or just practicing how to do it. And it also gives you something to talk about in interviews. So there's definitely more than one way to enter cybersecurity, and there's so many com or communities, especially in tech around London, that can help, you, that can help support you. So Zuntos, um, Ola, Ola's over there. Yeah, um, it's a group chat for people who study computer science. Quite a few of them do study cybersecurity. So if you ever have any questions, there's Zuntos. We have Foundervine. Um, there's some tech people in there as well. And that is my talk. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>